Hello. Hi there, you all right? I'm good, man. How you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Cheers, yeah. yeah. You hear me all right? I can hear you. You hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Cool. Yeah, cheers, cheers to doing this, man. Absolutely, man. Thank you for hitting <laughs> me up out of the blue and uh, asking me to come on. Nah, it's been... Really... It's interesting when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I've been following your account for a while and got the book here and stuff that I've been... Cool. That's Checking awesome. That's like a, a rare, a rare thing these days. It seems like that book. Yeah, I was reading about like some people responded um, on Instagram saying that they couldn't get a hold of it, and I saw something about you saying, "Yeah, for one reason or, an, or another, it's become quite hard to get a hold of." Yeah. 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 It's weird. It's on. It's on Amazon, but uh, you know, five hundred dollars for some reason. Wow. <laughs> really crazy. That's insane. Um, it's really nuts. Um, but I got a new one coming out, sort of a revamped version. So hopefully people can get their hands on that one now. Okay, so this is the new one coming out later this year. Yeah. Okay, so what yeah. does it, it's like a more, there's more to this one, is there then? Um, so so the, the book you're showing, yeah, came out like five years ago. And, and um, it, was, uh, it was very well received by fans and, and, you know, people who saw it, which is really cool. Um, that being said, it wasn't the initial book I had sent out intended on making. Um, you know, I collaborated with the publisher and the editor who are friends of mine and the book came out very uh, different than I had anticipated, but they sort of turned it into this, you know, uh, fanzine type of photo document book. Um, and threw in some articles and some other stuff in there that when I first saw it, I was just like, why, why is the fuck is there an article in my book <laughs> when it's supposed to be about photos? Um, so it might've been a godsend that the publisher folded during COVID and I got all the rights back. <laughs> right. Okay. So what do you um, intended then just purely photos or, or what? Yeah. I just, you know, I just sort of, I, I envisioned exactly that just a photo book, sort of like a hardcover, straightforward photo book with some text and some stuff thrown in, but um, yeah, that's what we ended up making is not what I envisioned. And it's, again, it's totally cool because what came out, you know, I ended up loving and, and sort of learning to, to, to love in its own way and appreciating it for the, for the, um, the group aesthetic that was put into it, you know, from everybody. Um, but that being said, so that book sold out pretty quickly. And now throughout the years, I've just been you know, sort of touching base with different publishers and like, oh, a friend of a friend, oh, he's with this bigger publishing place. That would be awesome to get it with like some big publishing, but, um, you know, books aren't really <laughs> a market in the world these days. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Um, so it took a little time and I was sort of wondering what if I should, what I should do with it if I should, um, you know, to try and do my own book or something try and publish my own own thing that people might like and then I sort of came across this great uh sort of smaller publisher in LA called Rare Bird that was down to make something out of it um and so we're just starting that process now of laying it out and figuring out design it's going to be a hardcover photo-based book um with a lot of those photos um, that were in the first book, but a lot of additional photos. There was a lot of stuff that, that wasn't in there, some more personal portraits and a couple of other, uh, just portrait pictures that I wanted in there. Maybe some more group photos that I never published. Okay, cool. Like that. Yeah, so I'm excited about it. And it's cool that people want to see it again, which is even crazier to me, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I look forward to that. Yeah, I yeah. saw something on Instagram you saying a lot of personal stories didn't make the book. That, is that right? Yeah, I yeah, I ended up writing a, a whole lot of a whole lot of through the years experiences hanging out with the guys. Um, yeah, and it's funny, I just sort of read through it quickly the other day. I was sort of going through it to see what I could put in this new book. Um, and a lot of it probably won't get put into this new book either <laughs> i'm realizing 
it's a little it goes a little too deep into some of the stuff that I just don't you know I'm not in the band so I don't know if it would hold very much interest to, to people outside of, of that uh some amusing stuff but looking through it it's it's like six years later you know that I wrote that stuff and I'm not a writer so there's also that aspect of it but that being said there's a whole bunch in the writing that I found that I'm going to pull for the book in terms of stories that coincide with the photos um those nights certain nights or certain you know small club experiences or what was happening during the bigger shows a little bit certainly trying to like you know fill it in a little bit but making it not take away fill into uh the photo story you know the document that is there as a whole because i there's sort of a a little bit of a story from the beginning of of us meeting in high school and going through the years together you know mm. so no, i'm trying so, to make it a, be very interesting yeah yeah i'm interested to see how it comes out too you know and and to see what the final result is and you know see how people respond to it again i have to be honest with you you know i've taken these photos of these guys for so long sometimes i look at it and it's just like this is pure crap man <laughs> <laughs> this is not a good photo this is just not holding up or you know there's some that do but i'm just being hard on myself but hmm. no, it's interesting it's reading like um reading mick rock's introduction to the book um you know and he says like the only advice i'd give people is to like just do what you enjoy but i guess sometimes like you say if you've been doing the same thing it's hard to know <laughs> sometimes maybe what what you do think is good sometimes i guess yeah it gets drowned out especially in art and you know when you're an artist sort of inside i think that happens a lot um you know but he's, he's a good example of somebody who mick rock who shot you know for a heavy period and still did up until his death but you know never made the past seem uh regurgitated or old or you know like he's trying to just like make a quick buck off the same fucking photo or same book or same same thing like that and i try i've started to try and look at this this work like that um of the strokes because i have i have other photos out there of course and and, and sort of a you know other musicians and artists and stuff um but nothing as uh you know as quantity and sizes as the guys in the band or that document that you know those photos i took so it's hard to um you know sometimes like oh another book or something you know what i mean like your mind to go to like oh, okay i'm making another book and the same photos are coming out again of the strokes you know and but yet there's been no new photos of the strokes in a very long time. And, and those aspects of what was and what has changed in all realms of, you know, personal lives and social media and, you know, who speaks and who's, who's in the same town and, and all those dynamics. And, you know, time moves on and things change and access changes and, you know, all that stuff changes. And, it's you know it's it's you just got to sort of pull yourself back and sort of okay this is this is what I got and I I didn't anticipate getting this when I was doing it you know starting in high school and until they got big and the clubs and bigger shows and all that stuff so I kind kind of try and look at it that way like it was never an intentional type of document of these guys it just ended up that way and now it's fucking 20 some odd years later and it's like the meet me in the bathroom stuff and they're still playing and you know the nostalgia is coming back for that era when we were all kids and now we're all like you know old and <laughs> <laughs> halfway through our lives all of a sudden yeah. yeah supposed to like get a bit of context on everything like it's in 1995 you met Julian and Nick, is it? Have a lunch or something? Yeah, yeah. I met Julian and Nick. We all met in uh in high school in nineteen ninety five, I think it was. We have another mutual, very good mutual friend of ours, um, named Claude, who wrote some stuff for the first book as well. Um, and so him and I had a class together, and then Julian and I had a class together, and Nick and my locker was next to each other, and. Claude knew Julian and Nick kind of so it was like this weird kind of 
natural connection where at lunch one day we just sort of all met up and yeah we just hung out from that point on it was really kind of really kind of crazy it was really very quick and we we all became friends very quickly um and we still are today which is pretty cool you know it's like 30 years later and it's rare that people meet in ninth grade or 10th grade or something and stay friends all these years um yeah like i just saw nick the other night for dinner and our friend claude and nick and i will have like group texts you know chats going on when we send stupid shit to each other <laughs> throughout, <laughs> throughout the week <laughs> yeah, yeah i think people uh, probably imagine the strokes to have quite a tight friendship group is that the case um i mean yeah yeah in terms of like who who their friends are you mean and, and themselves yeah. you mean yeah i mean um yeah yeah we're all uh, you know when we when we it's harder now because everybody's older of course and everybody is uh in their own life and jobs and kids and whatever else but it's cool when we go to a stroke show because it's a good time for all of us to sort of catch up sometimes <laughs> <laughs> when we haven't seen each other since the last show um and it's people, yeah, it's like the same people, some of the same people that have been there since, you know, high school when it was free band and, and all of that stuff. And we were just hanging out as high school kids. So stuff like that is cool. Or when you, you know, when, when a parent still comes to the show or something like that, one of the parents will still come or. Um, so in that sense, it, it is still sort of, you know, tight and you see the same people, you know um for them i think they're in a place where they're where they're working very well together at an older an older age you know it's 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 hard when you're with people for such a long time i'm guessing whether it's a band or marriage or friendship to to not get sick of people you know um so it's good that they can um you know if there is shit going on they can put it aside for the music and when they get on stage, it still shows that they're like, you know, one of the best and still have the energy and are still good friends and, you know, all that, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, was there any ever chance, was there ever a chance of you being in the band with a, did you ever pick up a guitar around them or anything? Um, I did. I played guitar or yes. And I played guitar a little bit, not as well as any of those guys, but before I'd met them and why I met them and no, not really. <laughs> no, it just sort of seemed natural that they, you know, Fab was in our school as, as well, I should say. So um, the three of them just sort of naturally gravitated because of the music thing. Nick had been playing since he was a, ki a kid, a kid, a kid. He was just always playing guitar all the time, all the time. He'd bring his guitar to, to the park when we'd hang out and stuff. Um, so, I mean, I would like play, you know, when we were in our rooms or we were just playing and stuff like that, we would, you know, play or, um, but no, I was never part of the band. There was a point where before Nikolai had, had come fully on board, like year, like years before it was even a band or anything. It was like, you should learn the bass. I was just like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> but I just kept taking photos instead. Yeah. yeah. Um, and still play guitar on the side and stuff, but. Ah, cool. Yeah. So, so, like, how? I mean, it's a, it's a question you just get asked all the time. But like, could you tell they had something pretty special early on, or did it just seem like a normal thing to start with? Uh, it seemed like a normal thing to start with. Yeah, I mean, it was just pretty normal. It, it's it's so hard to look back onto it because we're going back to like ninety eight now or something. I mean, it's really so many years ago, but um there was a point not so much in in 98 and 99 they, they were you know aggressively playing shows and practicing all the time and starting to write songs in those years it wasn't until sort of like 2000 summerish that it really felt like it was gonna it, like okay they were gonna start they had a buzz going in new york a little bit more people were coming out to shows within a couple of months so that's when it sort of felt um like something was was more possible it seemed like hmm. um you know it it 
it did happen quickly for them, I guess, in a sense, like, like people say it did and it didn't in one respect. I don't know. It's weird. There was nothing. Go it's true. There was really not much happening in New York. And I, I don't know if we knew of any scene. There was a couple of bands that they knew of and we knew of. Um, Muni Suzuki's and a few other sort of bands playing. But it's true. New York was not like any type of like scene. And I don't think they were playing to bring a scene back to New York or anything like that. You know, there's no intent there it's funny i was just listening to to you to gordon's interview that you were doing before um and hearing his side of, of stuff a little bit was kind of interesting um because what he was saying about i think you asked him how if he saw that they were going to make it and he said no rock was dead in new york there was shit going on they just seemed like a bunch of kids that were really into it and great but you know it it sort of felt like that and then they just kept going and they just kept playing and they just kept booking shows and they sort of, you know, stood on corners, handing out flyers and, and people would start recognizing them on the street kind of thing, you know, like, but he was wearing, you know, that their, their style when they first started their skin, you know, everybody we were just wearing Converse and skinny jeans. So it was easier for them to, to be spotted a little bit. And they were young, you know, everybody, nobody was really 21 yet. So. Yeah. Yeah, there's that photo in the book that you've called, we might you call, but you, you said it was like the quiet before the storm. Yeah. Outside the shop, is that quiet? Um, yeah, is that quite a big photo to look back at in terms of its meaning kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. When we're all standing, it was a New Year's Eve when we're standing on a corner. Uh, just about to say goodbye. Yeah, and it's, it's, again, it was, you know, it's all so quick at, at this point, but. Um, it's interesting to look back at those photos now, even for myself or for them, and to just see how young we were and to see, you know, it kind of does take us back into, that photo does take me back into that sort of quick little moment on a cold, you know, January 1st night on 3rd Avenue. Um, and again, it wasn't the intent. I just had my camera with me, you know, a little point and shoot, and they were standing there and I snapped it. So it's, it's, it, you know, it's some of the best type of photography is when you're not really trying to make it happen, you know? Um, and a lot of the photos were like that of them that I took until mm -hmm. I wanted them to sort of be shot someplace or something like that. But it just sort of, um, I just tried to continue the, the shooting and the document of, of how it felt went along with it kind of so what, um so it's not really covered like what inspired you to pick up the camera in the first place really uh my parents were in the photo industry ah, okay. my mom yeah my mom had shot in the early 80s she shot um some uh, like some insert album stuff for like lou reed and uh this musician johnny thunders this punk rock guy and then my father uh, worked and owned Photo Lab for a very long time. So I sort of had both sides of shooting and production based on my mom's side and then my dad's side was the more technical, uh, you know, printing side of things. So I was kind of lucky in that aspect. You know, it's not the, the best career choice to be making money at, I'll say that. <laughs> but. Uh, it was definitely interesting and, 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 you know, and cool to grow up around and, and, and inspiring to be around for sure. Um, and, it, it, you know, it set a path for, for, you know, the people I knew and, and the crowd that I would hang around with, whether it being their artist friends, you know, who had kids um, and us still being friends to this day. Some of them are actors or DJs or musicians or, um, a lot of it was just naturally sort of flowed through our parents, you know, like I still say we would never have met in high school if our parents didn't, you know, decide to put us in, in that private school for that one year or, you know, if we didn't get into that private school for a year or whatever. Um, and because of that, it ended up being this, you know, this insane long friendship type thing. Yeah, yeah. I just decided to keep shooting it. <laughs> you know, I kept getting access and I just kept trying to shoot. And, you know, at a certain point, 
I remember my father being like, you know, like just take as many pictures as you can. You know how long this shit lasts, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And it's just like, um, I said, excuse me. I was just like, well, it can't be, it's not like a forced thing, you know? And he, it, it there, there was those moments of, you know, the, all, the celebrity, you know, the personal celebrity moments of hanging out and all that stuff where I had my camera, where I could have taken more pictures or I could have taken photos at all. And I just didn't, you know, or if I did, they're definitely not going to be in the book. Um, you know, and that's something like my, my father, at a certain point, he was just like, you need to get that stuff and did it. And she's like, yeah, but it's not, it, it's forced if it's like that, you know, I'm not trying to, to force anything here. And, you know, they're my friends and I don't want people to feel like I'm there forcefully taking pictures, you know, mm. um, it was never like that. So I try not to be like that. And looking back at it, I probably could have taken more, more photos or you know moments where photos could have captured it maybe but for whatever reason i either didn't have my camera or I just decided not to or uh i was just in the moment a lot of me likes to just sort of you know not have sometimes not have it in front of my face and just enjoy and remember it yeah yeah you I guess there was a lot of big moments to enjoy in the moment kind of thing. Yeah, there was there was some fun stuff and it was cool to look back on it. And, you know, there's more memories. The photos sort of capture a specific moment for me. But then, you know, looking at those photos, like that New Year's Eve photo, or, um, you know, there's, I took some photos at a club called Don Hills back in the day of them. It, it sort of more leads to like, oh, I remember that night a little bit more clearly now. <laughs> transpired after that and you know stuff like that it leads into those those type of memories <laughs> yeah i didn't know before reading the book about the first iteration of the band was called just pipe and julian was on guitar is that right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah again it was so yeah it was such a lot it was like so hard to even remember it because it was so long ago and I don't even know if he like, you know, he, I think he had the guitar, but I don't even know how much he was really playing it. <laughs> to be, um, but yeah, that was like an inside joke type, <laughs> type thing at the time. It's funny that that's made it out into the world. <laughs> and people know about that. And like the description, your description of in New York is great as well. It makes it sound like a really fun place to be in terms of like, you say, like having Central Park. It was almost like your back garden kind of thing. Oh well, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it was great. It was be. it was great. It was great. It didn't feel as uh, as unsafe as it does now for some reason, you know. Where it was just yeah, and we were you know probably um, uh, you know thinking about it now. I have a four year four year old four and a half year old son now, and he's not there yet. But thinking back on it, you know, being a teenager as well probably. <laughs> we felt like it did, you know, the whole city was ours and we didn't give a shit about anybody or anything or, you know, we would fucking just, you know, drink on stoops and get high where we wanted to and, you know, like just be wise asses to people. And, <laughs> you know, which I would never, you know, if my son did that today, I'd be like, what are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> just like, you need to respect people. and da, da, da. So it's interesting how it shifts like that. But, um, and we also, I, you know, again, it was, it was also different in the sense that not as, uh, not as socially aware, you know, out there. We had working parents, all of us. So that was a big part of it. I think, you know, parenting now is a little bit more hands-on, it seems like, or hovering or whatever it is. But all of our parents worked. So it was, we were sort of left to our own devices from, for a, you know, from fairly early on in the early, you know, elementary school years. Um, to fend for ourselves and you know do it all until they got home <laughs> um and so in between that you know if you were somewhat responsible it seemed like you know you could get away with a little bit yeah you know. um and then yeah there's like a cbgb's gig that sounded quite eventful in the book <laughs> yeah down at cbgb's they played there twice um and we would go there back in the day before before that to see bands. And it was always just like shitty bands. The place was so shitty. It wasn't like we didn't get the experience that the people when it opened had. 
Um, but yeah, they played there and there's photos in the book. There's going to be some photos in the book from, from the two nights. Um, one of them was early on in the year, weren't any people there. And then the second show, again, they had built up more buzz and it was fully, fully packed at that point. And CBGBs didn't have acts like them playing. It was like, they mostly had like a, like new metal at the time was pretty big, you know, like POD type of shit. And they had a lot of bands like that playing there. Um, and they were playing and the whole, everybody was there for them and they were playing and they wanted one more song. They finished their set and they wanted to play one more song. Everybody wanted to play one more song. And then the engineer just like wasn't having it. And he started going, he went up on stage and started fucking pulling out all of their, the shit in front of everybody. And then they just trashed his stage and fucking told him to fuck off. And, <laughs> and everybody left. Everybody just walked out. Um, Cause th they were the only band to see there really at the time. Um, even up until they closed, I, I, you know, I only went there to see, I remember going there just for like special things like Joan Jett played there or, you know, like small invite. Or, or a smaller band like uh, the Eagles of Death Metal, this band Eagles of Death Metal, um, that were like known but weren't known enough, I guess. And we're playing at, which is one of the best shows I, I've ever seen. Is them playing at CBG because it was awesome, so cool. Yes, yeah. And there's a moment where he said, you know, you could tell things were taken off, and you went to see them play in Philadelphia, and like the Gallagher brothers were just outside, kind of thing. Yeah, they showed up. Yeah, exactly. That was weird too. That was, uh, I have some photos of them as a group that I took that, that day that are in the book. Um, and it's on the cover of the book. And so we, we, I met them outside of their, their practice space to take some group photos of them. Um, and we did that. And then they were going to a show down in Philly. I'm, I think this is the same night. I'm pretty sure. I've kind of made it the same night. I think at this point it's not. <laughs> But I, we went down there and, and yeah, Oasis was playing whatever big stadium was there. And how Oasis even knew about them, I do not know. I don't even know if, I mean, they hadn't, they, I don't think they'd been to England yet. I don't think they'd been over there yet. So I don't know how they found out about them. But I don't know if they made the show. Um, and I think only one of them ended up showing up whatever one that was always fucked up but not you know <laughs> not not the one that wrote the lead singer guy um and it was it was very brief and very sur surreal and yeah it, was, <laughs> it seemed like there was like a little bit of debauchery for like an hour like a whole lot of it right in that club for like a whole hour with him and then just like all right let's get in the car and go back home <laughs> <laughs> i'd be interested i'm sh i'd be interested to see if they've you know cross paths again or if which one of them has ever crossed paths with either with with that dude and if it ever came up you know yeah i think um i think Noel gallagher's always been well he was at the start he was like a big uh big fan of the band i think yeah yeah, yeah. But I, don't it's know, cool. I recently um i recently read something from bob dylan did an article he, he did an interview someplace and he mentioned Somebody asked him about new music and he mentioned Julian as one of his, one of the newer artists that he, he really looked up to. And I remember reading it and taking a screenshot and sending it to Julian. Being like, it's approved. You got approved by Bob. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, watching things like the in transit documentary and stuff, um, it's like, uh, yeah, a lot of that praise. I don't think they knew what to do with it. Did they? They all felt it was a bit like, much of the time but i guess like you can't really process it when that's happening yeah i would imagine that it's pretty quick and pretty fast especially in england because you know they didn't they weren't getting that here they, you know it's a, it's a different type of thing and then maybe the fanfare to go there and then come back and have not, not have it here you know complete fucked up mind shit on you as well i'm sure um yeah how long was that the case for like when did america kind of catch up with it do you think well i mean that the thing that they did have here that in 2001 i think they did an mtv bill they did like um that's pretty well known the way it was directed by roman coppola so i think that got them more known 
you know, MTV was trying to push the rock thing back at the, at the at, after like the millennium because it had died and it was all like boy bands and Eminem and new metal and that stuff. And they were trying to, some of the older people that, was, that were left over from the 90s in MTV, I think were trying to usher in rock and roll again. So they tried to get like them and the White Stripes and the Vines and, you know, the Hives to sort of out into the, the you know, the, the the mainstream by having them on um, like the music awards and stuff and showcasing them. But it just, you know, it didn't take off here. I remember a cousin of mine telling me back in the day, she was just like, I don't like, she's like, I don't get the White Stripes, you know? <laughs> And I was just like, what do you mean you don't get it? There's <laughs> really not much to get. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't know how to so I you know, I don't know where the di- I, you know, there's obviously a big big disconnect there, but they are known in the States. I mean that they're, they're you know, they are known here. Yeah, yeah. Obviously like you see you them play massive shows there, but yeah. yeah, they're playing big shows here. So you know, Strokes fans are are, are are very um they're very dedicated fans is what I, is what i've seen like if it seems like if you're a strokes fan they're they're really into the band um i know they have a, a an insane fan base in south america hmm. like really really crazy fans down there um where it's you know it's interesting you know i've known these guys and 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 we're all still friends and i love them and all of that but like i'm not part of the band <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it, it it sort of gets taken into the context i think of you know well he 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 knows the band and maybe he maybe he either a is is living in that atmosphere might have money like that atmosphere or um things like that so you know the band will tour and people there will be like are you here like you know please come out of the hotel with them you know what i mean like we like stuff like that and it's it's weird because it's just you know i'm not I, like i'm not part of the band people <laughs> i don't <laughs> i and i do appreciate the love of, of of you know everybody loving my work which is really really very humbling and nice and it being appreciated and looked at as um differently than i see it you know people people see some art and they see it they see a you know, they see a story of, of a band from the beginning getting getting sort of bigger and bigger. And, it, you know, they sort of see, I guess, what I unintentionally shot all the years, you know, which is nice. Hmm. And so finding new people to appreciate it, new generations is really cool and unexpected. So, Yeah, I went to um, the Strokes played um, in London just before COVID. And uh, I went to it and... Yeah, I was surprised by the amount of young people there. I was like, oh, yeah. I made, I like, I went to chat to a few of them just because I was intrigued, and they're like, yeah, hey, we love them. And like, I suppose there's no reason why they shouldn't. It's just kind of you don't think that's going to happen to you for some reason. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem like the type of band that would. That's what I mean. It's not really. They're big, but they're not. You know, it's not like Foo. It, it, it's not a, on the media scale. It doesn't seem like the Foo Fight. You know what I mean? Like the Foo Fighters, you sort of everybody knows the Foo Fighters, but it's weird it's it's it is a big thing you know and and they have you know people from like our parents you know my mom and dad or their parents their parents can listen to it and like it and then you know i have like a, my sister is now 20 years old 21 so she can enjoy it too, you know what i mean like she's really into it and so it's really interesting and then my four-year-old is even into some of you know it's like i'll play him you only live once and he's got he, he's into that so it's it does um it just proves the point that rock and roll can you know can spread over hmm. a couple of generations and i saw you know looking at your photos of when they played with the white stripes like how into the other but how into like that whole scene were you like were you loving it kind of watching gigs like that with the white stripes and stuff the white stripes i was really into at the time i was i mean i really really it was like to me that was that was the big thing i really dug it um here in new york and that's you know that's the other thing that sometimes i i wonder you know is if um i was pretty uh you know in in secular with those guys with the strokes you know i didn't really end up shooting any of the other bands in new york that were around at the same time 
I, I, I knew them sort of through the strokes or through McRock or through, you know, uh, circles like that and became friendly with them sometimes. Um, but I never, you know, I, I never really sort of put it out there that I was taking photos or, or trying to, you know, shoot other people and you know it's possible that it, the, the scene blew up very fast so it's not like there was time to sort of everybody really you know the strokes and yeah yeah as an interpol there was really no hanging out i don't really remember everybody hanging out again except for and it you know it, it comes through in the meet me in the bathroom documentary is uh, the moldy peaches with adam and kimia for for whatever reason and i understand it we all came towards them and they came towards us. And it was more um, the nerdy outcast type of thing. Cause we, you know, and we, we understood that in, in high school, we went to private school, but um, you know, we weren't outcast or anything by, by any means. Every, everybody was very, you know, every, it's not like more people were more popular than the other in our high school or anything like that. But you know, we were we were the kids smoking cigarettes on the bench during lunch. We were those kids at the school. Um, so it, it made sense that that it was the moldy peaches that would sort of come into the inner circle and, you know, get to know everybody early on like that. Um, and I don't know if I, you know, it's not something I look back on and think, oh, I should have sort of inundated the scene more or gotten involved in the scene more or anything like that um yeah it's just the way it got it's just the way it went you know and yeah 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 and then yeah the, the photographs the outside the music building yeah on 8th uh, avenue yeah yeah it obviously became pretty iconic and one of them ended up on the cover of NMA. like how big a moment was that for you that was awesome. Like that's, that's, I was really trying to break into enemy territory <laughs> at that point. I was really hoping that I could sort of get some work off of them. Um, Cause they, they were, it seemed like they were really big at that moment. I, I mean, at least here in, in New York, I was like constantly picking up every issue that came out. Um, and my, my goal was to try and to get shooting for them over here. But just the fact that they did that and did a whole sort of, you know, um, like a little mini poster thing back in the day in one of their issues was really cool. And the cool thing about that is that last summer I, um, I'm i working with a, with a new gallery in Australia in Sydney and the owner um, of that called Behind the Gallery, the owner of that, Stephen, when he reached out to me originally about doing something in Australia, having a gallery show in Australia, he said that he had seen He's known about my work since that enemy issue in 2003, which I found really fucking crazy because I didn't, you know, I mean, I didn't think anybody would remember my name or those photos or, or anything like that. But um, it's funny how that, yeah, that sort of side angle shot of them on 8th Avenue um, has become a, a like a, a quietly iconic photo of them, I guess, you know, um, and even even Valencia, you know, once in a while, he's just like, oh, like I picked up the book. He's just like, dude, that photo is fucking awesome, <laughs> you know. <laughs> or he'll say stuff like that, or you know. And and it's funny when I look at it because going back through the photos again for this for the new version that's coming out, it's like, you know, what I thought I had shot like a roll or two of film on them. Like it's really just like half a roll of film I took, and I got extremely lucky, and I got. Uh, I got extremely lucky, but with that shot, I remember taking it um, and knowing that it was a, a, an awesome shot of them. Um, even with Julian sort of being cut off, which bugs me now as, as being like a, a, a somebody who would never do that in a photo now. It's just like you wouldn't do that, but it works for that. Um, it works for that because it's innocent, you know, they're, they're, it's kind of innocent and the photo feels young. And it feels uh, it feels quick, um, but it feels like it's capturing, you know, them in a, in a sort of loose moment. Um, 
which I always hope my photos, you know, it seemed like a lot of photos people took of them, they're very stagnant and they don't really give much off emotion wise, whether it's in photos or on stage or if they're not really that type of band. But people have told me how the photos that I've taken of them, you see a little bit more looseness in them and then you can see that they're a little bit more comfortable uh, taking the photos, even though, you know, Julian doesn't really like being photographed or, you know, whoever doesn't, but luckily it came it came through, I think, you know, they were a little giving some of the photos. <laughs> Julian was always impossible to photograph. He was just, even in high school, it's like, I've got, a, you know, I don't know how many photos I have of him covering his face as I try and take a photo. <laughs> <laughs> so I wish I had some better photos of him, but it is what it is. You make do. Yeah. yeah. It really captures something. I mean, you know, I've only been to New York once in my life, but you get that sense in New York in that photo as well, which is good, I think. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I I like that. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and I've talked about this um, before with other people, but that that sort of, I mean, that was uh, pre-9-11. It was a couple months before 9-11, so there wasn't a shift in the world yet, you know? It was still still old, old time. Um, Just like, go, you know, it didn't feel like anything. It just felt like you were just going through your day. But yeah, those photos led to, you know, going to Philly and getting fucked up and shit. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um yeah. and you, know, you mentioned meet me in the bathroom. Um and I thought one of the most interesting things Did you got... see it. Yeah. Did you yeah. see the doc? Yeah. No, I enjoyed it, yeah. I just I just thought the uh yeah, one of the most interesting interesting things for me as like a Strokes fan was I uh kind of them going into room on fire and kind of how the dynamics changed and like how, you know, how visibly kind of almost worried Julian was um, with yeah. how it was going to be received and stuff. Like, what was it like being around him at that point? And like, did the dynamic uh, change kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, he, he uh, you know, I, I remember him drinking a lot at that point. I think he was drinking pretty heavily at that point. Julian was always good at, um, you know, distancing himself if he really wanted to. He, I think he's still probably very good at that, but um, he seemed to, it, it, it to definitely change and it had become a bigger thing. So when Room on Fire came out um, in 2003, they were playing LA the same week that the album came out. They were playing a string of shows. And I mean, it was much bigger. It was celebrity packed and it was just, it, I mean, it had definitely changed for sure um you know again i'm not in the band it wasn't in the band (laughs) so how heavy the vibes really got i'm not sure um but you know watching that watching that footage um reminded me of of him when he you know in those in those days um and again, it wasn't that dark for me because I wasn't around him like the other guys in the band. So I don't, and I don't know what pressure he was feeling necessarily um, from you know outside outside people. Um, so it's hard to tell. I know you know I know how Nick was dealing with it and some of the other guys, and they seemed very excited about it. You know, um, sort of first big big stuff you know big tours i think it was you know a much bigger scale of thing um you know and i don't remember them sort of being you know feeling bogged down by it but you know like i said julian was always sort of heavier on himself than maybe he (laughs) he needs to be um you know even in high school i remember you know my mom will she she She'll tell a story of how one time Julian called up and he, she, you know, he's like, hey, is Cody there? And she said, oh, hi, Julian, how are you doing? And he just said, why? <laughs> 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 and she's like, okay, I'll get Cody for you. <laughs> she's like, I'm just asking, dude. You know? Just asking how you doing. So Not one for small talk. Know. Yeah, exactly. So I think it was always, <laughs> it was always something that, that, you know, it's possible that darkness was in there early on. Um, but being older, I could see how it'd be there stemming from, you know, whatever it is, childhood, family issues, you know, um, a little bit more personal side of 
I knew of him growing up than than the fame side, you know. I don't I'm not really in touch with Julian that much and I haven't I don't see him very often or personally. Um which I think he does intentionally, possibly. But it's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's still he's still family and when we see each other at shows and shit, it's it's you know it's all big hugs and talking and all that stuff. Yeah, got us into that with um with God and Raphaela, but kind of yeah, like you might not see each other or speak to each other much, but there's that kind of relationship there that's always going to be there, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it always, it, it always, it's always there. Um, Valencia and I, like I said, Valencia and I are like basically b- blood brothers, and from day one, as soon as we met, him and I are constantly in conversation, weekly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll speak to Albert and and uh, and Nikolai and Fab sometimes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there's that there's a trip to Hollywood where you kind of got a sense of um how things have changed as well, but it sounded quite fun for you guys, really. You and Claude. Yeah, when we went out there, yeah. yeah. That was yeah, that was uh yeah. Yeah, that was fun, you know. I mean it was it was a lot of fun that, that at least that week we're in LA. I don't know the rest of the year for them. I you know, I went to a couple of different things, but that week out there, I remember being very fun. Um, I do remember, you know, Julian and the guys all being very happy that Claude and I came out to LA to to hang out with them for that week. You know, um, I think it, you know, it's possible. You know, I think seeing you know people like me or our friend Claude around still sort of brings a little bit of possible safety. You know, and just old 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 schoolness <laughs> yeah. sometimes um yeah and it's it's you know now there's like it's it's a different machine with them now and there's totally different people um running running the show um so i don't know anybody behind the scenes anymore so much you know what i mean but It'll it'll be the type of thing where like we go at, you know we finally go backstage and we're there and people will be like oh like oh you're Cody okay <laughs> you know, or like <laughs> things like that so we're still in the rotation I guess which is nice <laughs> um, they're still talking about us so that's good yeah. <laughs> I'll take it and just in terms of your own career like um, you know how did you meet the likes of Mick Rock and end up working with people like Kanye West and stuff. Um, yeah, so Mick Rock, I met in, in like 2000, 2001, um, through somebody who I met at a stroke show, actually. Um, and she was very good friends with Mick Rock's, uh, rep, who I'm still very close with, Liz. Um, and she's just like, you know, you're starting to shoot, you should try and, you know, try and assist this dude, Mick Rock. And I didn't really know who he was until you know, until I saw his work and I reckon it started recognizing his photos. Um, and I worked for him for free for the first couple of times. Um, and then he started paying me and then it just ended up being like a 20, so yeah, we, we worked together for over 20 years, you know, anytime he had a shoot here in New York, sometimes traveling around the US, um, we would just, I would always work with him and assist him basically. And he was um he was really fucking greatest guy to work for. He was very egocentric and <laughs> egotistical at times, but uh he was always very encouraging to me, very nice to me, um and always very welcoming and, and ending up being around him and getting to know, you know, his his, his sort of wife and daughter and becoming part of a, a little family uh was really something that I never you know I just I never thought that how me shooting rock would you know rock and roll would somehow fall into line with me assisting one of the greatest rock and roll photographer photographers ever and, you know getting to know him personally and, and spending time with him not just on set or working but you know talking and hanging out and smoking joints and you know listening to music and, and stuff like that um and he unfortunately passed away way too soon before his time. Um, 
but that man had shot some incredible photographs, really incredible photographs that I hold in regards, not just to music photography, but as photography history as a whole, to be part of, you know, included in, in photography history, because some of those images he took are just very iconic images for sure. Way yeah. more iconic than my strokes image. <laughs> you know, I got one, but he's got you know he's got about twenty out there. It's really it's really incredible the, the amount of work um, he did over the years. Just really incredible, and even still to this day, finding out like these weird you know when he, he when he wasn't as well known in the eighties and stuff, and these weird bands that he shot in the eighties and stuff you didn't know he shot. But well, he mm. was awesome. He was so cool. Yeah, yeah, and a great guy. you know, you mentioned you know, photography is maybe not the best or most lucrative but, career to have, but if, is that what you've you've done since since then? Is that is it become your main career, your only career? Um, it has been my main, um, let me see, it's my main sort of focused career, uh, in terms of keep trying to keep it going. I've had right now. I have a steady job. I have a full-time job um, working at NBC, sort of producing behind the scenes a little bit. Um, so, and I always sort of went in and out of having, you know, full-time jobs. Going back to freelancing for a while, a part-time job freelancing. Um, so it just depends on where I was in my life, the amount of work that was coming in, what I had to do to survive. Um, you know, and that's a whole other sort of head fuckery game when you're a creative person and you, you know, you're, you're trying to go one way or, you know, you want to go one way, you think you're going to go one way. Um, and then the reality of, of, of life and circumstances and, you know, you have, you get married and you have kids and you have bills and you got to do what you got to do to, uh, to sustain it all. But I think there's a fine line of, of knowing that, um, you know, what pays the bills isn't necessarily what's driving you. So I've been working a lot at that as well, you know, in terms of um, of this body of work. And there's not necessarily any newer images of, of these guys, you know, but it still stands up and it still holds the test of time, you know, and, and the full-time job that I'm at now affords to, to help pay for um, putting a book out or, you know, having a gallery show coincide with this book release in the fall, um, or, you know, the sort of overhead of things. Photography, is a, it's, it's a hard field to get into, and it, it shifted drastically. You know, when I started doing it, there, there was a real uh, drive between me and, and some friends of, of really, like, you know, persistence, 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 persistence. And some of us are still doing it today, and some of us aren't, you know? Um, some some of us have have taken full time jobs and still do it. Some of us, you know, are still just going at it. So it's about how you you, you end up dealing with it at the end of the day. But that being said, I did spend many much time freelancing, and and it ended up shooting yeah, Kanye West and John Jett and Lil Wayne and some other artists um, throughout the years. Um, you know, and again, it that the shooting uh, those artists. Uh, came about by being my uh, my stepmother was a producer at MTV and they were doing a lot of uh, sort of features with those artists uh, Kanye Lil Wayne or LL Cool J or uh, Alicia Keys a whole bunch of people um, and they always needed uh, a still photographer on set so I would go in and you know get hired to take some still photos and, and I always um you know, for whatever they needed the photos for, but I always tried to capture my own uh, images for myself, you know, by pulling them aside or asking them to, you know, spend five, 10 minutes with me shooting or something like that. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's in, it's it's weird, highs and lows, highs and lows, you know, in, in the photo field. Again, it shifted drastically. Um, in, it's a totally different type of medium and a new, fully new generation of, of art directors and, you know, what content is being looked for. It's all social media and Instagram based. And, you know, I am unfortunately uh, an, an older generation guy <laughs> who's learned to adapt, but, um, you know, just sort of 
is is happy with this document and and still you know is still shooting whether it's personal stuff or you know a few gigs here and there that i get or um you know, just having the stroke work being seen again and putting it back out in a book is 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 cool for me. You know, um, and having health insurance is not a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> Full time health insurance helps. Yeah. So, it's um, yeah, it's like that. It's 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 ever flowing and ever changing, and has for for many many years, and you know, it will continue to. Um, yeah and it's you know going back to the quote that mick rock said um you know sometimes it is about luck and being there and being at the right place at the right time i guess you know um and then sometimes it is just about shooting you know and that's i i you know again i got lucky with our parents putting us in that private school to meet up but you know the, the continuing to shooting was 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 just me continuing to do it you know and if if i if i had a full there was years where i had a full-time job and i would take vacation days paid vacation days to go on tour with them and keep shooting them and then there was times where i'd meet, go out to la to see nick and you know go to a, a show or something and i was fucking pissed flat broke you know and just had no way of surviving but i still went and i still took the pictures and you know yeah yeah made it work somehow so nice one yeah um yeah just aware of time but like really appreciate your time uh just wanted to finish on a few instagram questions that we got yeah Um, so wang double underscore zero five says just says describe nick (laughs) valenci Uh, uh, it's just so hunky, right? He's <laughs> just a hunk of a man. He's pretty dishy, yeah. Yeah, he. Uh, Nick Valencia is one of the greatest people that I know. He, he, <laughs> he is really. He, I, I will say, you know, and I'm not saying I'm not saying that the other guys to, to imply this about the other guys, but Nick has been the same person that I met in 1995 that he is the one I had dinner with him the other night, and there's a reason that him and I are still friends to this day. And a lot of this document, I have to be honest, wouldn't, and I've said this before, wouldn't have been possible without him, you know? Again, I'm close with the other guys and in touch with them, but he was always sort of the main, you know, the main, the main guy um, to, to, to make sure it was okay with and filter it through. Um, so Nick Valenci is a great man. He's a very good friend. He's very funny. He's an incredible guitarist. He's a good dad, good husband. He's just a good guy. That Nick I love him a lot. He's a really good guy. He is. I get a nice one. I mean, he's good looking. I get that, you know, but. <laughs> so. And then seeing me something new says, um, what's been the favorite, do you have a favorite strokes gig that you've been to? Um, the white stripes and the strokes at Radio City Music Hall was one of, one of the, the very, very best ones. Um, uh, one of the more recent ones, Barclays New Year's Eve show right before COVID was a very memorable one for a lot of people in terms of being some one of the newer shows. Um, being at Coachella with them in 2011 was a good one. And then it would go back to being at like, and there's photos of it in the book and the book that's coming out of being at Don Hills. Um, that show stands out to me a lot. And there's shows um, at Mercury Lounge that I didn't photograph that sort of stick out a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you have a yeah, do you have a favorite song out of interest? Can you pin it down to one song? You know what? Um, for a while I couldn't answer that, but one of my favorite ones, and they just released it on the uh, on the singles, is Hawaii. Okay. Cool. Right. Yeah, and it always has been. And in fact, I always told them back in the day when they would do that song in their set list, the shows were always better. Always. <laughs> it's and quite a fun song too, recently. It, yeah. It's a great song, and I said that to him recently. And Nick was just like, "Huh, huh, okay." It's like you need to bring it back because it's a good one. Um, I like Fifty Fifty. I think that's a good one. Oh, yeah. uh, Yolo's good. I like Ask Me Anything. Yeah, it's quite a few to pick from, I guess. And Someday is always great. I like Someday. Some of the early stuff. Yeah, I mean that's one that knows. That always and... speaks to me. Yeah, I was going to say someone that knows him as well as you. That must like. 
there's a real nostalgia feel to anyone any fan listening to that song to, to you that actually knows and that must be really nostalgic yeah 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 more so than the other one like last night isn't right i could sort of that's like my welcome to the jungle i don't you know or my sweet child i don't need to hear that one <laughs> yeah and then was great. the martin langhorn just says um been dying to get the book for years where can i find it so it's just going to be with this kind of re-release kind of new book that you're bringing out um it is going to be available it's not up on so the publisher is, is a company called rare bird um you can find them at rare bird lit uh on instagram um it's not up on their site yet but i just uh noticed yesterday that it is actually up on um it listed on amazon um as a hardcover edition so it's, it's listed as a pre-order right now on amazon um and it'll be available you know most places when it comes out um I'm not sort of pushing it too much yet because we're still design, you know, we're still just starting design and the the cover that is on the uh, that is on Amazon now for the pre-order is the old cover. Right, okay. So, you know what I mean? It's just sort of a placeholder for for it. so I haven't really said like hey, go check out the pre-order spot or anything like that. Um, but I'll be doing more push for sure as the year goes. Um, but I'm hoping it's available everywhere from, you know, from tiny little record stores. I'd like to get it into, you know, last time I got it into some smaller bookstores just by going there and, you know, it was bookstores in New York that I love and just walking in saying, Hey, would you guys carry my book? Um, which I really like doing that a lot too, trying to get it into some, you know, some places that are expected, but you know, probably I'm hoping it's going to sort of be pushed out there so you can it's going to be readily available you know that's the plan with this one is is um people who didn't get a chance to get the first one can grab this one and you know even even people that did get the first one if if you know maybe it's something you know a second edition or something different looking i'm hoping maybe a few people sort of dig into that too but don't yeah, feel pressured by a second version of <laughs> photos that you've seen by me by any means <laughs> <laughs> 